Thank you very much for that. That was a very nice introduction. De ergot et veri idenivan. Thank you. So thank you for bearing with me as I speak in English. Now, um, what I want to talk about is how we solve the problems with Islam. There's a lot of talk about describing the problems, a lot of complaints, a lot of people saying, isn't it terrible, the ended awful club. No, that's not what I want to do. I want to talk about solutions, what we can do. And the problem is because most people think we either submit to Islam or we have to resort to genocide, people then think, well, it's unthinkable. We can't think about solutions. No, wrong answer. There are other solutions apart from massacre. It is not all dark. I actually think it is unavoidable that we will solve this problem, that we will win. It will get bad in the meantime, but I think it is unavoidable that we will win hands down. And we have the opportunity, if we want, to do it and to enhance our own towering moral authority in the process. So, and succinctly now, what I think we're likely to do, to see, is to see things getting worse over the next few years as our politicians collude with the growth of Islam. In the long term, I think we will see Muslim people repatriating themselves out of our lands wholesale, voluntarily, without the need for massacre or atrocity. And that's what I want to go through. And so what I want to talk about here is what's happening very briefly, why it's happening, and what's likely to happen and what the end game will be, and then what we can do about it. Now, it's not pretty, but bear with me. This is reality. Reality isn't always pretty. But if you can do it humanely and if you can think it through, then it should work. Now, my name is Gavin Bobby, as you know. I'm very proud to be, called the, to be nicknamed the Moss Buster. Now, I'm afraid I have to tell you, I haven't fought 17 cases. That number is, in fact, about 60. 60 cases that I've fought. Thank you. <laughs> and the success rate is a little under 70%. I used to boast and brag that it was 80%, nearly 80%, but the politicians have become a bit more confident since, since then in betraying us, and my success rate has gone down to just below 70%, but that is still pretty good, and I'm still able to boast that I win, So, and I'm pleased to do that. Now... Why is that a serious problem? It's a serious problem because Islam, put simply, is a genocidal threat to us. Now, I don't say that lightly. That's not my definition of genocide. That's the definition employed in the United Nations Genocide Convention, which I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to go through this in too much detail. I don't have the time to. But it's necessary to, say, to, to state the seriousness of the problem. Now, if you look at Article 2 of the UN Genocide Convention, it basically defines genocide as uh, killing or causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, or measures intended to prevent births. Now, if you look at um, the conditions of life for, well, firstly, Islamic war, the conditions of the dhimmi, people who live under so-called Islamic protection, and the victims of the rape gangs. All of those things are done, those things that are covered by the Genocide Convention are done by um, Muslims in a uh, uh, Muslim society or even in our, in our own society. And if it's done with the intention of destroying a religious group, which includes a, re uh, a non-religious group, then that is genocidal. That is a serious threat. Now, that threat is put through by war and by population replacement. The, the, the Muslim population of my own country, just to give you an example, since 1950, the Muslim population has doubled about every 12 years, sometimes sooner than that. So if you take, if the current Muslim population of Britain is probably touching about 4 million, then if you double every 12 years, you can see that Muslims are online on, that, on, on those numbers to become a, a majority sometime in the 2050s. So it is a serious threat. And it looks, I can understand why people feel that it's, why people feel that it's hopeless. Now, what I want to go through is why is that happening? That's happening for two reasons. Our politicians are doing it to us unashamedly. And secondly, we are letting them 
do it to us. Now, why are the politicians doing it to us? They're doing it because of all of, the, all of those bad things that you see associated with Islam, the sense of division, the sense of feeling ground down, the sense of home or your neighborhood no longer feeling like home, the sense of loss of identity. Those things are not unfortunate byproducts of the policy. Those things are the policy. Politicians want to do those things because it makes people easier to rule. It grinds you down. It makes you more manageable. And politicians like power. Politics is a business and an addiction to a politician. And that they, they will be quite unscrupulous as to how they increase their power. That is not conspiracy theory. That is a basic primal urge, the will to power. That's no more conspiracy theory than sex drive. A, a boy chatting up a girl. That's not a conspiracy. That's just, it's almost nature. This is what politicians want to do. And they want to increase their power. And they find that Islam is a very good way of grinding people down to make people more manageable, to make you, us, more manageable. That they, um, every violent boyfriend understands that. You don't have to be intelligent to understand that. Uh, a neighborhood thug, a tin pot dictator understands that. A, a wife beater will know that if he, the more he beats his wife, the more he denies her a sense of identity, the more he, he divides her from her friends, the more dependent she will become and the more powerful he will feel. Politicians are not that much different. It serves their interests. If you doubt that, ask yourselves, if it is simply incompetence or naivety, why is it that the same pattern is repeated right across the whole of Western Europe? Incompetence and naivety have random effects. This forms a pattern. Again, ask yourselves, uh, over the last 15 years or so, there have been numerous uh, opinion polls conducted, where, and they're quite embarrassing to the authorities, where they go to people and say, what's the biggest problem that we face today? And always, in the top two, certainly in the top three, mass immigration, particularly Islamic immigration, will be cited as one of the main problems that's faced, usually with a 70% majority. Politicians are not going for those votes. And I think we can agree politicians want votes they want to be in government but they ignore those votes why do they there must be some reason and uh, what i'm saying is it serves their power better to promote the growth of islam because islam the problems it creates the chaos the hostility that does the dirty work for them it makes us more manageable and the question then is why are we so foolish as to allow them to do it why are we so passive and the simple reason is we're focused on day-to-day -day survival. We need to survive, and surviving means financial survival. That doesn't mean we're all shallow and materialistic. What it means is, um, what we say to ourselves is, well, I'm gonna focus on surviving today. I'll worry about civilization tomorrow. I'll look at it tomorrow. You would have seen that in conversations you would have had with neighbors. And you'll think, why are they so, so passive? Why are they just standing by letting it happen? That's because people have other day-to-day -day concerns to, to rely on. And we let the politicians uh, get away with that. We want what is working to keep working. Financial survival in particular means the welfare state and government management of the economy. In a big state, welfare state and economy, that's what survival means. The welfare state keeping going. And that... And that is a problem if the welfare state goes down. It is not something to look forward to. Now, what, you, what you'll find is that will change if the state and the welfare state goes down. Firstly, you'll see the power of politicians will fall. And secondly, the welfare state will go. And then people will wake up in a bad mood. People's incentive to let politicians keep doing this will go at the same time that politicians' power goes down. Now that, that uh, I think what this means is we cannot look to our politicians to put this problem right. I know, there is no politician in my country saying anything critical of Islam. They're all falling head over heels. In the recent debates as to who should be conservative, who, who should become the next um, Prime Minister. They're falling over themselves to say nice things about Muslims and also saying on the public debates, Assalamu alaikum and all, all that claptrap they're coming out with. You, you are not going to get politicians to resist uh, Islam. And
the, the, uh, the bulk of the public are not going yet going to demand that they do. But that will change if the state and the welfare state goes down. And that is a, that is a likely possibility. I think that is an unavoidable possibility. The state, this is not an attractive prospect. This is where I risk losing your sympathy here, but bear with me. Just because it's unattractive doesn't mean it won't happen. The state could go down for two reasons. First, the weight of debt, government debt, or corporate debt, and housing debt. If governments go broke, they can no longer afford to pay for the welfare state. If the welfare state goes down, you get riots in the streets. If you get riots in the streets, the authority of government declines. If the authority of government declines, then the ability of government to raise money through taxation, through borrowing, that goes as well. And then government has even less money to spend on welfare. So the welfare state goes down even more. And you get a feedback loop of a cycle of decline and destruction. That is probably what I think we are looking at. If that doesn't happen, the weight of Islam is likely to break the state. That is written into the Islamic source code. That is written into the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sirah. There is no example in history of a country going from non-Muslim to Muslim without the Muslims making war on the non-Muslims. That has happened every time. Now, it's best expressed, I think that is best expressed in, um, a, 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 in a quote from the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, in America, where the, the Muslim Brotherhood stated its aim as being eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. So eliminating and destroying Western civilization. And that seems to happen. That point seems to come quite early when Islam reaches much above 15, one five percent of the population. If you look at Lebanon in the 1970s and 80s, if you look at Nigeria in the 1990s, much above 15 percent, the chaos and hostility makes society, starts to make society ungovernable. And the authority of the state breaks down. And the reason that's an issue is because if that then collapses the welfare state, you get another feedback loop. You get, you get that feedback loop of uh, politicians' authority, the authority of the state collapsing, uh, and the authority of law, the, the ability of the state to impose law then breaks down. And then what, what you appear to get is a lawless society. And in that kind of situation of, of breakdown like that, society settles down, settles out along ethnic lines. And in those situations, you are likely to see the Islamic areas separating themselves out, declaring themselves as separate Sharia areas. They effectively are, in, certainly in my country, in many parts, there are already Islamic areas that run their own, their own legal systems. But it's not official, it's not formal. But if you get the collapse of the state, that will become formal and that will, will harden. Now, that might seem to you to be the point at which we have lost. But what I am saying is that is the point at which we have won. If that happens, as I think is unavoidable, that is the point where we have won. And I'll tell you why. Firstly, if society settles out along ethnic lines, and if you get the division between Muslim society and non-Muslim society formalizing and hardening, then what you will get is the separation between the two populations. Now. What will happen in those Islamic areas? Think about that. The, the conditions in those Islamic areas will become miserable fast. They will find themselves cut off from the productive non-Muslim part of society. They will find that when they declare their Sharia areas, they have to, to adopt the fiercest forms of Islamic enforcement. Because, if, again, if you think about it in those Sharia areas, you will have a lot of different races, a lot of different ethnicities, and they all have to be tied together. And the only way to do that is through aggressive enforcement of Sharia law. How else do you... Um, you'll have Turks, Moroccans, uh, Pakistanis, Somalis, and they are normally quite hostile groups, and very hostile groups, Kurds. 
Kurds and Iraqis, or Kurds and Turks, who do not get on, how do you force them to combine through fierce Islamic enforcement? That will further harden the sense of separation between Muslim and non-Muslim society. What, uh, and what you'll find is they'll become poverty-stricken as well. What, you find, what do you find in the non-Muslim areas is, I think, will be quite interesting. If the state breaks down, you will find a state of lawlessness. There will be no law applied, and that is a problem. That's a problem for us, the non-Muslims, particularly because we like the law. We like to be free. We like to live in peace. We like to be productive. If you don't have any law, then you can't trade with each other. You can't feel safe to live with each other. So if the state can't provide law, people will probably have to provide it in a consensual, voluntary way. And think about this in a, in a kind of opt-in, opt-out way. A little bit like if, you, if we all here decided that we wanted to adopt some system of law, a code of law, where we all observe the same rules in our dealings with each other, laws that can be enforced. But which of us would join a system that allows the practice of Islam within it? If we voted with our feet, if we had to vote with our feet, which of us would say, yes, I'm happy for Islam to be practiced in the area within the system that I'm voluntarily joining. No non-Muslim will have any incentive to sign up to a system that allows the practice of Islam within it. And if you don't believe me, I ask you one question. Can any of you name one good thing about Denmark that is in Denmark because of the presence of Islam? Your social life, your literature, your sense of community, your history, your culture, which which good thing exists in Denmark because of the existence of Islam? And you, you will choose. You will say, I'm sorry, I just don't want, if, I've got, if you've got young children, you will not want Islam within your territory. And that will further separate out and harden the division between Muslim and non-Muslim society. What then happens in those Islamic areas? They will find themselves cut off. Once they declare Sharia areas, they are cut off. First of all, the welfare state will go for them. No non-Muslim will say, you've cut off, you've declared yourself Sharia, you've said you are no longer bound by our system of law or our system of democracy, but we're still going to pay you welfare. No one will do that. There'll be a counter-incentive not to do so. How many, of, how many Muslims will remain in this country if they're no longer receiving welfare? I don't know. I would say half, maybe half. Let me take it a step further. It gets a little bit darker here. Take the basic amenities, telephone, gas, electricity. Muslims won't be able to pay their bills. Muslims are not a productive people. Islam states that for Muslims, your livelihood is the non-Muslims. You extort money out of the non-Muslims. That is your livelihood. That is stated in the Hadith. Um, a left-wing commission called the Social Mobility Commission in 2017 stated that the, uh, the, the, the rate of full-time employment amongst adult Muslims in Britain is 19.8%, okay, 19.8%. But they, uh, they said that it's all our fault because we're all a bunch of racists, it's nothing to do with the Muslims. Not their fault, they're just the victims. Well, they have, I'm surprised it's as high as that. The reason it's as high as that is because they are in contact, they live in prosperous Western societies. What will it fall to once they separate themselves out into Islamic, self, in self-ghettoization? What will it fall to? Will they then be able to pay electricity bills, gas bills, phone bills? Okay, let's say half have gone because the welfare state has stopped handing out money. Maybe another, and half of the remainder will go when gas, electricity and telephone get switched off. Let's take it a bit further. Supposing they can't pay for fire service, healthcare, water supply or drainage then it goes from bad to dangerous downright dangerous you do not want to live in an area where there is no drainage for obvious reasons and then you will find it is not simply tempting to be offered a plane ticket home that becomes that becomes a necessity and at the same time non-muslim society will have the incentive to buy out islamic areas Islamic land in an Islamic area will not be worth much money. It will not yield much rent. Muslims will, do not make a lot of money. They are not a productive people. Non-Muslim society is productive. 
non-Muslim society can do much more with the plot of land than Muslim society can. Therefore, non-Muslims will have the incentive to go to Muslim landowners and to say, I will buy out your plot of land. Here is some money. It's worth a million dollars to me. It's worth a thousand dollars to you and you're not getting any, it's not worth that because you're not getting any rent. There's no one to pay you any rent. I'll give you $50,000 and a plane ticket home. And that land will pass from the low bidder to the higher bidder, as it always does. In those ways, you, you get the incentive for Muslim residents in strict Sharia areas, poverty-stricken areas, to leave. And you will get the uh, um, incentive for non-Muslims to buy out those areas. Now, that's quite a, that's not a very nice prospect, but that is not one that I'm creating. That is not one that any of us are wishing for or creating. That is one that is created by our self-serving politicians. If any, we want to blame anyone, they have to blame themselves. I simply trace it out. I simply observe it. What, um, uh, uh, the only people that I have to say I do like are the leftists, the leftists and the collectivists, because in this scenario, they work for us, unbidden and unpaid, 24 hours a day and they are fueled by the power of hatred. They're always calling for more government spending. They're always calling for more Islamic immigration. And that is likely to break the system and create the conditions that I'm talking about. But it is not our fault. There is nothing there that we are doing to, to we are simply observing the system as it unfolds. But I have, to, I have to address the question, is it right? I can't deny that what I've described will involve an awful lot of suffering for Muslims in non-Muslim lands. Conditions will have to get very grim before they decide to go back to their ancestral homelands. That is not something that I am calling, I'm saying should be inflicted upon them. I simply observe that. And that system that I've described, that is not our moral failing. It is all that we will have to do is to allow people to stew in their own juice, to allow people to reap what they sow. Allowing people to stew in their own juice, that is not massacre, that is not a war crime, that is not genocide, that is simply tough love. It is allowing people to reap what they sow. And people should be allowed to reap what they sow. People, it is just, it is right, it is inevitable that people reap what they sow. And that is simply what I am describing there. It's dark, but it is not our fault. So the question is, what should we do about it? How do we, what do we do in the meantime to try to make sure that this is as bloodless and humane as possible? Well, I think there are two things, two things we can do. The first thing is to, is to think, what happens if the authority of the state breaks down, as I think is unavoidable? Like, maybe I'm wrong, but it is not a prospect that can be dismissed out of hand. And how do, how do we develop systems of law that we can use if the state can no longer apply the law. If the state's there, no longer there to apply the law, you have to find law from somewhere. I, I have written a system of law that people can use for free. It's on my website, gavinbobie.com. Um, if you go there, you, you, you will see it. Um, that, that's the sort of thing that we have to do so that we can maintain our traditions of order and prosperity if the state goes down. I think that is necessary. That's probably the most important thing because the more orderly our society or our part of society remains the more humane we can be the second thing i think is the other thing that i do and that is stopping mosques from getting planning permission now, i'll give myself a little plug here because i think it is worth doing the reason i think it's worth doing is that is because mosques delineate they define islamic territory the first function of a mosque is military and political it's religious after that. It's religious significance comes after that. The first mosque in Medina, Mohammed's first mosque, that was a military centre, a political centre for making declarations of war and, and dispatching armies to go and conquer the Arabian Peninsula. And all other mosques must copy that first example. Where you get a mosque, that delineates Islamic territory. Now, the fewer mosques you have, the smaller Islamic territory will be. And the smaller Islamic territory is the less um, easy it is to militarize it, the less defensible it is, the more powerful we remain in relation to the Islamic part of our society. And that means the more powerful we are, the more options we have. 
And the more options we have, the more humane we can be in dealing with them, in, in being firm about allowing them to reap what they sow without resorting to some uh, historical patterns of massacre that have occasionally prevailed in Europe. But that is what I think we can do. That is what I think we should do. Try and think of law if the state goes down. Try to stop mosques getting planning permission in the meantime so we can deal with it easily. And if we do that, we will win. Thank you.